Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if we could come to attention, please. Uh, now, I'm acutely aware that this session is bumping up against lunch, and I don't like to stand between people and um, their food. So I'm not going to give a long introduction to the people who are on this panel today. Uh, none of them need a significant introduction because you all know who they are. Uh, but just as a quick recap, we've heard this morning what sort of a state the world's in and the sort of challenges that we're facing and the almost be bewildering array of challenges we're facing. And we've just heard uh, from the Vice Chief's office the sort of principles for building an integrated ADF at, um, that will be able to help us deal with the challenges we're facing. What we're moving to do now is to start to talk about how we make that happen. What are the challenges, uh, what, what sort of are the policies and implications of building that joint and integrated ADF? And we have a um, stellar panel today. We have uh, Rebecca Skinner, Deputy Secretary of Strategy from the department, and the, each of the service chiefs. So I'm going to shut up and sit down and let these people um, tell you about the challenges of building the joint and integrated ADF. Rebecca. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, um, also um, happy to be here with, uh, with my colleagues from uh, Defence, the Service Chiefs and others. Um, I thought I would just start uh, by talking about how my role uh, fits into developing the ADF uh, we have of the future, what those difficulties are for me, uh, how I try to get through the night without waking up because you can be overwhelmed by them uh, if you don't find a way through it, and how therefore we treat um, those challenges that come confront us uh, as we uh, try to build the force uh, that the white paper strategy asks us to. So what is my role? Well, broadly, I see myself uh, as the keeper of the white paper. I'm the steward for ensuring the white paper strategy is implemented. I'm responsible for the policy, the strategy, the contestability, the management of strategic risk, which I share with others, and the intelligence uh, as an enabler to delivering the outcome. My role really is to ensure that the strategy is aligned with the resources and that the capability gets delivered. I have a few levers through which I can use, not, not uh, 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 not to put uh, too fine a point in it, but the enormous resources that sit in my group that m help manage those levers. But the big levers are really around the policy setting, uh, the contestability role that you have um, probably heard from, from Michael this morning, and my role as part of the strategic centre on the Defence Committee, the Investment Committee, the Enterprise Business Committee, uh, the, def uh, the uh, Civilian Manage Workforce Committee, the COSC and the um, Policy Committee. So those roles uh, form part of the levers with which my uh, role and the people who work for me seek to ensure that the strategy is being delivered within the resources that we need to manage. Now, what is the strategy? Most people are very aware of it, that the strategy is to develop a force that can uh, enable a secure and resilient Australia and defer, um, deter, deny and defeat attacks or coercion uh, on Australia, giving us a secure near region, uh, particularly Southeast Asia and uh, South Pacific in terms of uh, maritime focus, and a stable uh, rules-based global order, which and that's where we see ourselves operating in the Middle East. But I think it's important from where I sit to um, think about what a joint and integrated ADF is. And I just want to make the point that uh, it is the whole defence enterprise that really is about delivering the military capability or the military effect at the end. It's the capabilities, it's the platforms, it's the training, it's the science and technology, it's the ADF members, it's their APS colleagues, it's all the enabling services, the people services, the financial services, the estate services. And it's the defence industry base. Together, that's what delivers the white paper strategy. And I think if we narrow that too much in any way, you don't get the outcome that you need. I too was, uh, I accompanied the VCDF on uh, the trip recently to the Middle East. I too was 14 hours in the Wedgetail aircraft, um, which was a tremendous opportunity 
for about seven hours, and then the other, which was it was great fun, but there is a limit to um, what you can do in a 14-hour period before you don't have the capabilities to actually participate in the tasks. Um, the what I would say about that experience was the amazing capability, but the fact that those uh, those crew members uh, they had to be fed. That aircraft had to be fuelled. Um, the amazing logistics that exists at AMAB uh, as part of the supporting f uh, the Australian activities in the Middle East, none of those things are delivering a capability unless they're all working together. So one of the most important elements is how the whole system works together and that's what I see is the joint capability. And I just thought I'd make that point. But what are the challenges in terms of uh, how I do my role? It's, I can put it on an org chart and it can look fairly straightforward. The challenges for us, though, are fairly uh, broad. Firstly, there's just what you've probably discussed this morning, but the changing nature of the strategic environment. You even stand here today and look back a year ago and you ask yourself what the world looked like then. We've seen a rise of populism which has changed the nature of uh, elections that we didn't think uh, uh, would go the way that they did. Um, we've seen an increasing change in the power dynamics and we've seen a rise of terrorism in our region. In some ways, um, it was quite palpable the sense of um, the effect the uh, issues in the Philippines had had on the region and I was just uh, had the opportunity to be at Shangri-La last weekend and it was terrorism was something that you could really feel in the conversations and in the engagements that occurred with uh, regional leaders um, in uh, Shangri-La last weekend. So apart from the geostrategic and other security challenges, the defence uh, budget has, a, has an amount of rigidity in it that also uh, makes it a challenge to be able to pull levers. We have long lead times in capability, so you can't really turn on and off capability programs uh, like you could some other, um, in some other businesses. Our budget next year is about $34, $35 billion. 21 billion of that will go in some sort of capability program, so it's locked into contracts and procurements, and 12 billion goes in people. So you can see the flexibility in the budget is very, very small, and that therefore limits your ability to pull financial levers. We're also in the process of building a future ADF while reforming the organisation, and that puts pressures on your, um, your skills, uh, managing your workforce, and the um, uh, appropriateness or, of your employment frameworks for contemporary needs. We're industry, our industry policy statement also sets out a journey of uh, reforming our engagement with industry and the way in which industry uh, participates in the defence cycle. The challenge also is about how well uh, the system as a whole can absorb the 2% of GDP that is uh, coming to the, through, through the defence organisation to deliver this capability. So you can see that there are some, some, challenges, uh, some challenges there. But how do we treat those challenges? We need to find a way to make sense of all of the complexity that surrounds us. So what we developed was the strategy framework, which is up on the screen, a, try, a way to try to, in simple terms, put down the artefacts that help us navigate the challenges and also get a sense of the cycle that needs to occur over a 12-month period so that the organisation can remain flexible and agile. Most of where I focus my attention is in the orange box. If people want to uh, see this slide more closely, people can go to the Defence website. We do have a document called the Strategy Framework, Exhibit A, that you can get, um, that actually takes you through each of those. But what you see is us setting at a regular point in time the Defence Planning Guidance, which, if you like, takes the white paper and sets a more classified set of direction into the organisation. The military strategy uh, then discusses how that's enabled, and we have a quarterly process of reviewing strategic risks and seeing what adjustments might need to be made in the short to medium term, which is about two years. And then 
and bundled into that is our budget cycle where we might need to uh, adjust the integrated investment program that Mel was speaking about, uh, where we might need to deal with a risk that is, uh, that is emerging. That goes into the budget process and then of course we have a process of governance and performance reporting. Though that is how we attempt to make sense of the role and as I said my role is to make sure those orange, partly those orange boxes function well. Um, one thing I would leave you with uh, and that is that is, this is both a cycle, an annual type of cycle uh, and a journey. Um, the cycle is the way we make sense of things, the cycle is the way in which we can uh, regularly sit down and have a structured conversation about our future. Um, how well we do that is still a journey while we're reforming our organisation. And I would expect over time, we're not quite through the first 12-month cycle, and over time I think we will learn from the cycle that we've gone through this year about how we can adjust our approaches going forward. So from my perspective, I'll leave that there and hand over to my uh, capability manager colleagues. I am the intelligence capability manager as well, but I would highlight um, the, the joint capability manager that um, uh, Mel commented on as a fourth sort of arm of capability management. And I think that goes to remind us that if we don't resource a, a, a strong focus on joint capabilities, then we, we won't get the outcomes that we need despite um, all of the attention. So I'll leave that there and I will hand over to um, Chief of Navy. Thanks. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. In response to an earlier question about agility, you will notice in your program that the Chief of Army was going to go before me, um, but we decided to change it at short notice. Agility in practice. Uh, the other thing I learned was um, before I came here today, uh, very briefly before I came here today, I found out that I was acting VCDF for succession purposes, so I feel like the designated survivor. But I have been asked to uh, briefly talk about integration requirements of future platforms and systems. And uh, clearly, the fear of any speaker at a conference like this is that we are all going to say the same thing. But then I thought about it when I came up here, and actually, you do need to hear exactly the same thing from each of us, because that is the, the sole intent and purpose of what we're going to do. So I'm not going to talk at all about the Naval Shipbuilding Plan. It's out. You can read it. Nor am I shamelessly going to promote my own book on the Navy and the Nation. Um, I'm here to actually talk about the Navy's perspective of what is an ADF requirement. So my aim in the time available is to help you understand how Navy, as part of a joint force or a combined force, must evolve if we are going to build the requirements that are set in the Defence White Paper. The force that's described in that White Paper, the right force that's fit for the right purpose. By this I mean that how the future Navy fleet, which is actually a complex system, will work systematically as a joint force alongside the Air Force, the Army, Defence and all other government entities uh, that are needed to achieve or contribute to the dominance we require in any future maritime domain conflict. So let me start by saying uh, two and a half years ago I launched Plan Polaris which is Navy's strategy to prepare for a very complex future strategic environment that Rebecca has just spoken about. Polaris acknowledges the challenging character of global affairs and recognises the need for us to set a heading for what I term a fifth generation Navy. Not that I've stolen that from Air Force and the fifth generation Air Force, um, but it is of a significant symbolic statement as to guide us as to where we're going to be. It recognises the need for a force that's capable of generating and deploying self-supporting and sustainable maritime joint task groups. Unlike Air Force's Plan Jericho, uh, Polaris demands innovation at all levels of our organisation and it recognises the need for technologically advanced naval systems to combine in the modern fleet system and to integrate seamlessly across joint and networked environment. But I do hesitate to add that it's, this is not in itself the end state. It's what you actually do with a network which is important. So importantly, Polaris is not focused just on individual ships, individual submarines or airframes. 
it actually recognises that our platforms need to operate as a system of systems. So why are we, or would it appear that we're transiting back towards a task group oriented Navy? And what will it actually look like in future years? Well, while over the last decade or so, we've managed to have individual ships that have met most, if not all, of the government's requirements, it's a task group oriented Navy that provides governments with more options, significant and necessary options to meet a full spectrum of threats that may challenge us in the maritime environment and enable governments to implement Australia's strategic policies. But in reality, Navy has always been a task group oriented Navy. As recently as 2003, we were deploying two and three ship task groups to the Middle East as part of operations Slipper, Falconer and Damask. We were linked at that stage. And we had a task group mentality which dominated the operational and doctrinal culture. We have just not practiced it as well and as often since that time. However, we must look forward and now recognize that the nature of the 21st century task group operations has changed markedly from where they were over a decade ago. And this new reality has been most, mostly brought about because of the changing threats and the changes in Navy capabilities, but also in our operational concepts. Importantly, it enables us to embed concepts such as distributed lethality into our designs, which will enable interoperability with our key allies. Distributed lethality is about maximizing the adversary's vulnerabilities while, in, while reducing our own vulnerabilities. It's no longer about concentrating effort as a close-knit force. It's now about complicating the adversary's picture by distributing our capability across a much broader medium. The upshot is that the ability to deliver lethal effect is now distributed across these platforms, but which operate together as a single system. This also means, since one platform can defend another, that our risk is managed and distributed across the entire task group, ultimately providing greater resilience. The recent public release of information regarding the USN's development of the Naval Integrated Fire Control counter air or NIFCA, gave an insight as to what may be possible when a specific system is successfully integrated at the task group level. Using existing sensors, networks, and combat management systems, together with a new generation of more capable weapons, NIFCA rebalances the battle space between our maritime force and the adversary's aircraft or weapon systems. And while we are not likely to achieve distributed lethality in exactly the same way that the USN might, it serves as an example of what can be achieved, particularly when we consider the commonality of systems and operational objectives that we do share with the USN and the US Air Force. But we do need to know how we will fit the ADF joint and allied operational constructs, where we fit into those constructs, and to incorporate these requirements into our force design, as we heard from Mel earlier, at the drawing board. If we are to maintain our technological edge and our capability to superiority, as was well defined in the latest white paper, then we need to ensure that we are not just thinking and theorizing about multi-domain operations. We need to turn it into reality, into practice, by enabling our technological edge at the capability planning, operational, and doctrinal levels. The complexity of modern C4ISR systems and maritime weapons means we must acknowledge our interoperability requirements at the drawing board. We must therefore acknowledge the interdependent nature of our force from the outset. And the key to our military effectiveness will rely as much on the skills, our skills on the drawing board as they do on the battlefield. This means that Navy's ability to integrate the fleet with Wedgetail, JSF, the P-8s, Poseidon, Triton, Growler, and any land-based air defense mission systems, for example, will be essential to realizing the force supremacy potential of these individual platforms. We must design our forces to be capable of coherent, independent ADF operations, which I describe as decisive lethality, while also being capable of 
contributing individual ships, submarines, aircraft, or task groups to coalition operations at both regional and global levels. And that's delivering distributed lethality. It means that Navy is as committed to plan Jericho and Bathsheba as we are to plan Polaris. And I've often said in public that for me, success is when an LHD is at sea, well that in and of itself is success for me, um, <laughs> but when an LHD is at sea and there are more army uniforms in that ship than there are Navy uniforms, that is success. Fortunately, government through the white paper has given us the chance to redesign the way we do business through the first principles review in delivering the defence capabilities that the nation needs. We have the opportunity to ensure our future fleet's combat and weapon systems are designed to work together as one and that our people are trained to realise the potential of this fighting system. The next generation of air, ground and naval forces will be characterised by technologies that enhance our situational awareness and our tactical reach. Each individual platform will have significant enhancements over the capabilities we experience today. But it will be at the system level that significant force multiplier effects will become apparent. So hopefully you can now see that we aren't just a joint force. We aim to be an integrated force, joined at the hip as we move to deliver what the government has mandated. It is implied in the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The end result of this collaboration means the variety of technological developments, when batched together as a warfighting system, brings a substantial advance in fighting power and consequent lethality. Perhaps the discussion is best described through an example of cooperative engagement capability, or CEC. While we have had significant exposure to these systems that expand situational awareness, Navy is looking to exploit the potential for remote curing of weapons with the introduction of, of CEC in the Hobart class. CEC is about a systematic approach to collective defense and offense. It makes us more lethal and it makes us more effective. But achieving the levels of systems integration that we find necessary will not be easy. We will need to clearly define the capability requirements for the integrated force and we ensure we are prepared to exploit and leverage new technologies and systems. For Navy, the continuous shipbuilding strategy is a necessary means, indeed I think the only means by which we will achieve the level of systems integration and maintain the technological edge required for Navy to function at a task group level. And to achieve this successfully, our design philosophy must be in thinking ahead. We must be interoperable, interoperable by design and in design. This is particularly the case for the C4I and weapon systems we select and then evolve through life. We now need to be thinking and designing ahead. And we need to see Navy, Army, Air Force, broader defense and industry at the planning table. A one defense enterprise will allow us to do this with much more gusto than we have done in the past. And my observation, as a member of the investment committee, is just that. It's a more contested, but equally collegiate commitment to joint force design through integration. So in conclusion, let me say, we can become a highly integrated, networked and capable multi-domain force. Our responsibility now is to ensure that we understand and drive these integration requirements at the drawing board. This means we need to understand the importance of force design. We must also develop the necessary information to continually challenge and validate our requirements at every stage of the capability and material acquisition process. And above all, we must do this together. And on observation, I think we are. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate. Uh, well, I'm going to open my remarks today by quoting a speech that the Chief of Air Force recently delivered in Washington, D.C. He said, Our most immediate challenge concerns integration within the ADF 
and in particular our earlier generation systems. Equally, we must examine how Air Force will operate with our principal ally, the United States. Finally, we need to understand how we'll function at a force level with regional partners still developing their force structure who do not possess the generational capabilities of Australian or American forces. This is a complex set of challenges, unquote. I couldn't agree more. If we were to delete the words Air Force and insert Army and perhaps Navy or ADF, then I think that the Chief Air Force has summed up, for me, Army's immediate challenge in our continuing journey of building a joint integrated ADF possibly more so, contestable, but possibly more so than the air or sea domains. The land environment consists of some very complex terrain, cities, jungles, littoral environments, swamps, deserts, mountains, and the people who live in them. The army is in them, around them, and moving through them. The terrain effects of where we operate are often incompatible with the idea of ease of connectivity and integration. Further complicating matters is the sheer number of nodes that we seek to connect to be an empowered and capable force. Now, our Navy has some dozens of very capable major fleet units. Our fifth generation Air Force in entirety will have around 300 flying platforms when the 2025 objective force is realised. Just one of Army's combat brigades may have over 2,000 nodes that potentially need to be connected. And all of them are moving through and seeking cover in and being obscured by that complex terrain I mentioned before. Furthermore, the integration of our land combat system is a different kind of challenge because of its physical boundaries. Put simply, a warship or an aircraft is a combat system contained within the physical shell of the vehicle. There is still an integration issue across platforms to generate those systems of systems that the Chief of Navy was speaking of. But to a degree, these are known properties and conditions. The land combat system is not bound in the same way. Until the Talus Hawkeye vehicle, land equipment has been retrofitted into the network. It hasn't come integrated into the shell of the vehicle. And the land network between nodes is, of course, dispersed and very dynamic in its nature. So before we even begin to consider the challenges, very considerable challenges of integration and connection to the other parts of the joint force which is absolutely essential, or to regional and coalition partners, again, essential, the Army has a fair problem just in trying to integrate within our own land combat system. But we can't do it exclusively as though that is the solution. It must be the fully connected result. ASPE recently described Army as a third generation force. If we're fighting together, Army has a lot of catching up to do. We haven't always been as successful as we would hope in doing this. And here I'm talking about the technical issues I think the cultural and professional training and development issues are very well advanced. And I'm deeply impressed by the young people I see across the entire ADF. Back about 15 years ago, Peter Lay started the Hardened and Networked Army Initiative. We are still not yet a networked army today. Given our record and the challenges we face, I would think it would be heroic to declare that we will be an effectively networked land combat system with whole of system coherent design operational 
within a decade. My point, that's a quarter century of transition from an analog to a designed digital force. Building this network combat system needs deliberate and coordinated design. Traditionally, the Army has focused on equipment. Increasingly, it is the effective integration of this equipment and our people that matters to ensure capability for and with the ADF as a single fighting force. Our current Land 200 Project Tranche 2 will begin the transition of a battlefield management system concept towards a networked combat system that integrates the sensors and firepower systems on a land platform and between people, vehicles and headquarters. It will adapt an open architecture approach for integration on land platforms involving and improving our ability to adapt to technological change. Importantly, it will enable Army to move beyond stovepipe proprietary systems. Our future will be shaped by problems and possibilities. The problems we need to worry about are the interoperability we need to generate with our principal allied United States, other Five Eyes nations and coalition partners. The signature management that emissions will generate. Network resilience, the graceful degradation under attack of that network and coping through our people, their training, their doctrine, their skills and their culture with catastrophic network collapse through mission command. The possibilities come through our joint force focus and the land combat system that emerges by design and intent. We need to stop buying stuff and then agonising for a decade over how to connect it. Specifically, I seek a land combat system that is both a component of and connectable by design into the ADF joint combat system effect, a top-down design and architecture which will form the nervous system of this combat system. In turn, we need to drive the way each platform or capability acquisition is planned and acquired. The sequencing of that acquisition and how it connects by design into the backbone of the land combat system. My head of land capability, Major General Kath Tui, likes to say, quote, our preference is for military off the shelf. Unfortunately, we've never found a shelf we didn't like, unquote. <laughs> we will and need to critically look at MOTS, COTS, and any other form of acquisition for that system's ability to connect into our nervous system. The Army's Land Network Integration Centre is providing the testing and proving ground for design integration, interoperability and the development of our command, control and communication systems. Training and simulation is being established as a core component of junior leadership training, ensuring that our next generation of commanders will think and fight digitally. All of this is consistent with the Defence White Paper vision of deployable and mobile networks, joint task forces as the foundation of ADF operations. This is where we need to be as an army, a component of the Australian Defence Force. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to ASPE for the opportunity. Uh, this is not uh, a speech. It's more a conversation of sorts where I'll raise a couple of points, a couple of observations, and move through where I think Air Force is playing a part in what our future Defence Force will look like. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that our threats are evolving, but also our Defence Force is evolving and evolving much more quickly than many of us would have envisaged only a couple of years ago. So new operational domains, and we heard the conversation from Mel, VCDF group, 
about whether they are actually domains or part of uh, all of our business around cyberspace. And one that's particularly significant for me and one I don't think we've got our heads around yet is uh, management of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, but in many respects, and I've said this before, uh, the Air Force is uh, both good and lucky in that in our capability development cycle, we are uh, at the front of having to make some decisions or at least influence the way the future will look. Uh, total six slides, less than 10 minutes, eight I hope. Uh, used to be that our capability cycle took, I'll take guesses from the audience if you like, but in my mind, seven years from good idea, go and look at it, develop it, start using it, whether you fly it, sail it or, or drive it, shoot it, uh, about seven years or so. Uh, we went decades actually to go from dumb bombs to basic uh, laser guided weapons. On today's battlefield, if it took us seven years, uh, we would fail, is my suggestion. We're now looking at a cycle that is much more intricate. Uh, it needs more people to be part of the decision uh, that you're about to make. Uh, it also is one that uh, is le less easy, is my term, to measure. Uh, that is, uh, if we're looking at uh, maybe uh, countermeasures and then counter countermeasures, and then we're going to counter someone's countered countermeasure, that happens in hours, days certainly, not in the months or years that we've currently been used to. We read recently about opportunities for us to use low observable technology. F-35 is certainly a representation of that. But low observable uh, operates across many spectrums. It's not uh, just about the air domain. And I think uh, as we go through an intelligence-led approach, there'll be those who want to take away that uh, capability edge that low observable brings. Uh, we speak a lot about uh, weapons, fuses, aircraft, ships, uh, tanks and armoured personnel carriers. They're the kinetic elements of what I think a joint force uh, needs to have. We do leave behind at times uh, those elements that are uh, cyber, those that are technologically driven, and it is should be no surprise to anyone sitting here that the 1950s and 60s, those in uniform and those that we worked with, owned the technological edge. That is not the case anymore. Industry does. And I know we've written about it, because it's on one of those, but I don't think we've found a way to make that happen just yet. We talk about it. We have uh, industry as a fundamental input to capability, yes. The conversation is more, more vibrant, but I still suggest that we haven't found the right way to connect industry, innovation, what is possible with what we need. In my view, the white paper is a grand document. It's set out very well. It makes it relatively easy for a capability manager and the other capability managers to use. Uh, the IIP is integrated. We've seen movement within the IIP that is professionally done and able to carry through those elements of the white paper that the government have asked us to deliver. Uh, industry policy statement is vibrant. It is being used. Uh, we heard about it at Senate estimates a number of times, uh, and the answers were clear. As part of that, though, uh, I felt that Air Force needed a way to prioritise the way we delivered the elements we've been asked of in the white paper, and so launched the Air Force strategy. There are five vectors to that. Uh, it's the joint warfighting, it's people. This morning, uh, I, I would offer to you the answer to one of the questions I get asked often, what keeps me awake at night? The answer to that is nothing. But what do I think about first in the morning as the, the piece that we need to fix, and that's people. Uh, the, finding the right people to come to Air Force in my case, but to the Defence Force more broadly, how we educate them, how we motivate them, and how we keep them. I think it is still a challenge for all of us. Comms infrastructure and international engagement. We manage that through Jericho. It's an enabler. It is a cultural change for Air Force. And I very much appreciate the words uh, from Chief of Army and Chief of Navy uh, and from Rebecca that Jericho is, in many respects, just Air Force's part of a joint approach. There will be uh, competitive uh, tension, I think, in the information age as we go through developing what the F-35, the P-8, the, the Triton, C-27, uh, what all of those uh, can do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd offer to you 
that this diagram should be useful to all services and all groups within defence. It says a lot. How does this diagram represent, or how do we go through in a force design context, giving the armed reconnaissance helicopter what it needs to know about what is five miles ahead or what it might need to do next? What do we need to put into the air warfare destroyer's ops room that is available to the P-8 and the Triton, but at the moment is not transmittable? What is the single electronic warfare frame, the single piece of information that the soldier needs to move another 20 metres safely and effectively uh, across the ground that Angus spoke about? It is a complex environment. The same piece of information is not useful to every soldier at every point. One of the pieces that I think we are not yet conversant with is we talk about C4ISR, we talk about ISR, we talk about ones and zeros, but it is becoming, in my view, much more complex than that. Where you got it from, how it is characterised, how you plan to use it is becoming an increasingly complex part of our management of uh, intelligence and uh, mission data and we haven't yet cracked that nut. It is something I think industry uh, will play a vital part in delivering for us. So it really means for me, in a very simple sense, the growler on the ramp's not much use to me if I can't have what I need to make it a useful platform on the battlefield. The other element of, uh, of this diagram for me is something that uh, Air Force is beginning to work very hard on. I'm bringing some focus to, and that is, what does the soldier, sailor, airman, intel analyst, uh, geospatial analyst need to know about what Air Force can do. Uh, we spoke uh, earlier, heard about uh, trips to the Middle East and a ride on a wedge tail. That is one way to demonstrate how do I get that to a population of 90,000 to understand what Air Force can bring to the fight that you might need. Air Force is the first to get the new gear. Jeff Brown did a great job at getting stuff. We need now, though, to bring those pieces together. Uh, it is an opportunity for Air Force, and indeed I believe it's an obligation. I'm not saying that Air Force has the right to demand what we do in terms of top secret uh, networks, what we need to do from space, but what I am saying is we have an obligation to at least raise the question, is this a priority that defence would choose? And if we are at the front of that line to ask the question, that's okay by me. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on ops right now, all three services and those groups that support us. Uh, the Australian population understands that we are uh, on ops. We need a new approach, I believe, uh, as we prove, as we train, as we've done major exercises overseas and as we continue to fight Daesh, that without these technological uh, steps, at an increasingly high frequency of evolution, we will fall behind. Uh, I believe the description we've seen from and heard about uh, so far this morning uh, has been uh, accurate. But I do maintain the view that it's not just the aeroplane, the ship or the tank. Uh, if I was, and I know this is uh, heretical in some respects and some previous service Air Force chiefs would not approve, but I have said it before, I will give up a single F-35 if it means the Air Force can integrate and fight better uh, as a total fighting force. Uh, we should all aim for that. Good morning.